Hey everyone, welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. This is episode 558 being recorded Wednesday, September 18th, 2019. I'm Jim Tannis. I'm Jeremy Holstrom. I'm Josh Walrath. And I'm Maury Teitelman. And yes, we have Maury on today, back after a long absence. So good to see you. Uh, thanks for coming back. And uh, we, we had your motherboard review last week, but hopefully you'll have some good stuff uh, to share with us uh, this week. Uh, Sebastian is just on vacation this week. Uh, uh, so don't worry, he, he'll be back uh, hopefully well-rested, unless he's running for the border while he can. But uh, uh, until then, uh, thanks for joining us, folks. We do this live Wednesday nights normally at 10 p.m. Eastern. That works out to about 2 a.m. UTC. Uh, you can join us live. Uh, we can. Uh, we have a, a website where we host the video on YouTube, and that's over at pcpro.com slash live. Or if you want to know when we go live uh, for special events or when we have a delay, you can join our mailing list over at pcpro.com slash subscribe. It's just a plain text email that we use. Actually, I was told it's technically not plain text. There's a little tracking image only so that we know who's opened it and who wants to unsubscribe and things like that. But that's all. We, we don't share. We don't market. It's only used to let you know uh, when we go live. And uh, if you want to support us here at PC Per, and you know, you, if you run an ad blocker, or you just want to you want to help out, head over to patreoncom Per, where you can become a monthly patron. And uh, and every penny you spend there goes directly to running this site. And uh, if you the, the way we we do the little deal here is if you become a new patron during the show, or you increase your existing pledge, edit your name field. And uh, I'll read whatever you put in there. So it's it's been pretty funny at times, uh, pretty heartfelt at others. So uh, take advantage of that if you uh, if you feel like it. Uh, and if not, that's okay too. But just, we're glad you're with us. But it's been uh, it's been an interesting week. Uh, Sebastian is on vacation, but he has been publishing like a madman because he queued some stuff up for us. Uh, so why don't we jump into those reviews? And so I'll I'll be going through these, and, and you guys feel free to jump in too. Uh, Obviously, I'm sure we'll miss something, some nuance that Sebastian noticed. Uh, but we'll start it off uh, first with an interesting uh, card. It's another third-party Radeon RX 5700 XT. Now, of course, uh, these launched uh, back in July with Ryzen 3000, and uh, Sebastian reviewed the reference design. But the reference design was uh, it was a blower style. You know, it was all right, but it was a blower style. Performance was good. Price was good for that performance. But we were waiting for these cards, and we reviewed a couple uh, uh, in the last few weeks. I think last week we had the XFX uh, Thick THICC card, and here we've got the Sapphire Nitro Plus uh, RX 5700 XT, and this is a monster of a card. It's a triple cooler design. Uh, it's $440 uh, list price. That's about a $40 premium over the reference uh, RX uh, 5700 XT. But it's got... Uh, it's got quite a lot you get for that extra forty dollars. We'll take a look at some of the pictures here. Just just a very impressive uh, design. I know there's some uh, comparison shots in here somewhere of the reference next to this, and you can see it's it's just it's just dwarfing that that not small to begin with reference uh, fifty seven hundred XT. It's it's, it's longer. the big spoon. Exactly yes, and they don't they look happy there. Uh, it's got. Uh, this very interesting cooling design. I don't know if you guys ever uh, had a uh, Sapphire uh, graphics card. I don't think I've ever personally had one in my system, but they're they're running with this this thing where they this isn't the only card that does this, but they've got this uh, triple fan design where the two fans on the outside uh, rotate in the same direction, and the one in the middle rotates counter counterclockwise or, or counter to whatever the outside is rotating to, to create this this vortex of air that cools the card more efficiently. Uh, the, the fans are also easily removable so that you can pop in uh, fans with, that are designed for this with addressable RGB. Very easy to upgrade those fans and replace them. Jim, I think uh, I think Gigabit had a design like that um, uh, uh, sometime last year, maybe, where they had two fans spinning one way and then the other fan spin the other way or whatnot. Okay. I don't remember yeah. what series it was, but... Yeah, I'm sure this isn't the first ever toy with that. I mean, but it's uh, it's it's good to see. I've never personally had a card that that ran uh, quite like that. Uh, there's three BIOSes on this guy. There's uh, the the normal or like the performance BIOS. So you're gonna get you know get some noise when you start pushing the temps. There's the quiet BIOS, and then there's something called a software BIOS, where it when it's in that mode, you can switch via their Sapphire software 
between the performance and quiet mode. So that's really handy. You don't have to reach in the case and, you know, get, get a little pen or something to flip those little switches. Uh, so, you know, good features, good build quality. If you look at performance, it's not, you know, you're not getting huge performance boosts over a reference. Uh, not that we necessarily expected to. The the big thing with this kind of card is that you're going for for uh, low temps and, and low noise because that RX 5700 XT, any, any blower style card is going to, is going to produce some noise. And so we look here at Far Cry 5 at 1440 uh, Ultra, it's getting an average of like 103.7. Uh, and then you look at the, the reference, uh, let's see, where's the reference here? And it's getting 99.3. So four frame per second difference. And then a couple uh, in between for the thick car that we reduced or that we re reviewed last week. So not huge performance there. Final Fantasy, the Shadowbringers, uh, Final Fantasy 14 Shadowbringers benchmark. 109 frames per second for this uh, Sapphire Nitro. The thick is just ahead of it at 109.5, and the reference is down at 105. Again, you know, four or five frames per second. Metro Exodus, uh, similar story. And if you want to see uh, all the tests, you can check out uh, the review here at uh, PC Per. Uh, but uh, the, the the short of it is, this is about, like I said, power and uh, or temps and noise. So it does draw some power. We're looking at the power consumption here the Sapphire Nitro Plus from the walls drawing to 350. Now that's nothing compared to that thick that we uh, reviewed last week, that the XFS thick two, 375, which was which leads all of the cards that Sebastian has uh, recently reviewed in his his roundup of this, uh, this price range. So uh, it's drawing some power, but it's not uh, obscene. And when you look at, uh, it's got dual A pin power connectors. And when you look at temps, uh, if I can find them here, I guess he didn't have a graph for the temps. I think he just mentioned it. Uh, but it was, uh, you know, load of 66C, uh, noise levels down in the, you know, the high 30s. It's 5.6 5 decibels lower than that thick card from last week and 10, more than 10 decibels lower than reference. Wait, he just, he just said 66C with a 87C hotspot in a minus 27C room. I is think Tilde is funny I think looking. Tilde, yeah, I think that's, uh, I think he's... No, it's, it's, it looks like a minus to me. What, yeah, what, what like do you do to, this man to make him test in such conditions? Hey, he's up in Michigan, you know, he's got a... It's cold. Although, it's not now. Dedicated it's, it's overclocking. Yeah. So, so if I ran that card here then in Dallas, it would probably melt through the center of the earth then. Yes, yeah. yes. We'd have no problem getting uh, goods from China. We could just take them through the tunnel that you made. But uh, the the other uh, update to this card, the thing that that uh, Sebastian liked when he reviewed his previous uh, Sapphire card was that they've got this sort of proprietary uh, tricks software, T R I X X, and this does a number of things. You know, it does monitoring and it does fan control and lighting control. But the cool thing it does, and it did this before any other card, was that it does this. Um, this, this scaling using Radeon uh, image scaling. And so you can tell it, uh, let's see right here, it's called Trix Boost is what they call it, uh, but it's using the, the technologies, I'm sorry, not, not Radeon image scaling, Radeon image sharpening. And so what you do is you render the game at a slightly lower resolution than your native monitor. And then it uses those, those built-in technologies with Radeon image sharpening to upscale with theoretically no visible loss of quality and so you get a performance boost without really noticing any any drop. And he tested it. I think he said Rise of the Tomb Raider. Uh, his monitor was 1440p, but he he tested at a resolution of 2304 by 1296, which is a 10% reduction in rendered resolution. Turned on that Radeon image sharpening, and he said he didn't he couldn't tell a difference. Uh, so that's that's pretty cool to see, you know, to see a feature like that. And and that's. Uh, you know, hopefully that'll, that'll be easy to access and, and more, more cards from other manufacturers as well. But uh, overall, he really liked this card. He called it the, his uh, favorite or the best Navi card he had tested to date, gave it an editor's choice. And so that is the $440 Sapphire uh, Nitro, Nitro Plus Radeon RX 5700 XT. It's nice to have third party stuff out in uh, pretty good quantities right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because they need it. AMD needs it badly. And they, they need partners and they need consumers. And I mean, it's not like AMD's in, in, you know, really bad shape, but they could certainly be in better. 
shape. So yeah, this is a nice card. Sounds like it keeps cool. It's not too terribly loud. Aesthetically pleasing. Yeah. Triple fan. And, you know, worth that $40 premium if you can find it for that. Yeah. I think that was his one caveat was, you know, with all these cards, don't don't go nuts. Don't pay that high over retail. Wait for the... These are good cards at their list price. Don't don't go nuts. Um, but uh, all right. So let's, uh, let's check out uh, Sebastian's next review. Uh, this is a uh, a new case. I saw this at Computex. They had these out. This is Be Quiet uh, with something different from them. This is a new series of cases, the Pure Base 500, and it's sort of targeted. It, it, it's an, a full ATX case, but it's compact, and they're kind of targeting a budget, or at least for them, budget price point of, I believe, $75 to $85, somewhere in there. It depends on the options. Uh, another difference for them is that it's coming, it's going to be available in black, white, or sort of like a gunmetal gray. And, you know, black, obviously, that's the Be Quiet uh, default. And they've had a few special edition white cases, but this is going to be one where you can, you can go out and it's going to be available in that white color if you like it, or if you do like the gray as well. He got the white one to look at here. And you have an option of a nice tempered glass side panel or or not. And so it's it's a small compact case. Uh, again, depending on where you pick it up, seventy to eighty five dollars for the price. Uh, also, to, the, the varying price there is too, whether it's the tempered glass or the solid side panel. And it's a you know it's it, it's unusual for be quiet, but it's a typical compact ATX case. I think it's fair to say. Uh, you've got uh, you know no no front panel five and a quarter. So sorry, Josh. Uh, that's how that goes. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, you know, you've got uh, the, the PSU shroud along the bottom. You've got uh, in the back behind there, you've got two, um, let's see if I can find a picture of it here. You've got two uh, three and a half inch drive bays tucked behind the power supply there. Cable routing, lots of little areas to, to connect uh, two, and a, two and a half inch uh, solid state drives. And uh, that's, that's kind of odd placement for uh, drive bays though. You see how they have the drive connector, the... Um was well, SATA drive connectors right behind the CPU socket. That could be troublesome for hot SATA drives, but I mean, you don't have to do yeah. that. There's plenty of other spaces you could put them in, but it's just an odd, uh, I've not seen that before on, on cases. Cause you're, they usually like to leave that space free because that does get hot, especially if you're using a, uh, beefier CPU or overclocking. Yeah, that's, that's true. And usually like, because a ton of cases have this, but it's that bracket that holds those drives is down, so it's not in that open area directly behind the, the CPU. At least as far as I've seen, like on the uh, fractal design cases, do that a lot. But um, another another feature that he liked is that there's this removable bracket that has the logo on it in the front of the case, so it's good for cable routing, and uh, and also just looks nice if you get the tempered glass window because you got the nice logo right there. Uh, there's a uh, a full size uh, uh, dust cover runs the entire length of the bottom, so that's that's good, uh, easy to remove and clean. And pulls out from the front. It does. It yep. looks like, which is brilliant. Uh, good ventilation along the the opening of the front of the case. So you got the sides that are ventilated. So if you've got front intake, uh, it comes with two fans. It comes with two 140 millimeter uh, Pure Wings two fans. So it's not their Silent Wing series, but at this price point. You know that's that's not too bad. These are these are good fans. Uh, I've never had a be quiet fan I didn't like. Um, so they they come with the two of them. There's one in the front, one in the back. Uh, so intake and outtake. Uh, there's an optional uh, panel for the for the top. You can either have it. Uh, I'm sorry, that's the uh, the side. Here we go. So you can either have a sound deadened solid panel on top, or you can get a mesh panel that all, or you can use the mesh panel that also comes with it. So if you want additional airflow on the top at the risk of added noise. That's an option there for you as well. Uh, the the bracket that we talked about inside, the two and a half inch bracket there, everything kind of comes out, the three and a quarter inch drive, very modular, very easy to work with. And here's a finished build that uh, he put together. So a nice case, it's, you know, you definitely kind of recognize it as be quiet, but it is unusual. They usually go bigger, they usually go more expensive. So if you wanted to be quiet case, this, you know, this might be something that's that's in your price range. And I, I know, too, he also said that the cable management, uh, it looked he was worried because, you know, he had to pack a lot back there. But there's ample room behind on the backside of the case uh, before you put the door on. 
So he didn't have any ca cables that were cramped or, or crushed. Uh, so unless you're the sloppiest of cable routers, you should be fine uh, without uh, having to worry about that there. Uh, let's take a look real quickly at uh, the temps for this thing. Uh, so we've got the uh, the pure base is down here. He, he tested it with both the default solid top panel as well as that mesh panel. Uh, and temperatures were higher, higher than some of the cases he's recently tested. But it's it's a um, it's not a very high airflow case. There's only two fans that come with it. You could certainly do things to to mitigate that. But of course, we're we're it excels. We're be quiet as a company excels is noise. And so when you look at the noise values, it's it's leading the cases he looked at recently. Um, uh, with uh, system idle, it's it's 31 dB, basically just above ambient. And uh, at, at load, it's into the low 30s, 33, 34 decibels. So uh, not too bad at all there. And uh, you know, he says it looks good. It's well constructed. It's, you know, it's a good German company. Um, you know, we like their stuff. And, and so gold award for that. It's a good, if, if you haven't been into, if you haven't bought a Be Quiet case yet, uh, it's worth checking out. It's, it's uh, at, at that price point, it gets it down into where you're competing uh, for more builds and, uh, you know, something to, something to check out there. So that's the uh, the Be Quiet Pure Base 500. All right, so as Jeremy alluded to earlier, though, if you do want RGBs in your case, Corsair is back with a new one. They've been on a roll. They've been releasing cases, like it seems like every couple of weeks they've got a new case this year. And uh, this one just came out. It's the I Corsair IQ 465X RGB. It's a mid-tower case, uh, tempered glass, a ton of RGB all over it. Comes with those addressable wow. RGB fans. Uh, and it's and when you consider the cost of those fans, this is not a bad price. I believe the list price is $150. Let's verify that. Yeah, $149.99. Those fans alone, a three pack of those addressable RGB fans, I think is $120 bucks when you buy it. Now, obviously, you know it's they're Corsair fans, so they're getting a discount. But the point is, like, if you wanted to otherwise go buy some fans, and you also needed a case, I mean, this would be a no-brainer. So this again, this is a, a compact case, ATX and below. Uh, it's got uh, a very aggressive design that kind of fits with a lot of Corsair's recent uh, recent designs here. Uh, it's, this, it's got this this uh, solid glass front panel, ventilation on the on the sides as well as on the top here, uh, on either side of the front panel I/O. Uh, no USB-C though. The front panel is just two USB uh, 3.0 Type A ports, a uh, three and a half three and a half millimeter audio combo jack. And a reset and power button. So that's that's crap. Yeah, that's some, USB C. That's, that's no, limited. They they, um, they spent all the money on the fans, Josh. They did. Damn them. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So uh, magnetic I've seen more, uh, more shots of the case. Uh, you know, it's, it's got uh, it's got an optional vertical GPU mount in the back. It doesn't come with the uh, adapter to mount it that way. You'd have to purchase that separately. But it's ready for that. Uh, it's got some cutouts there for the. Uh, uh, PCIe slots if you did want to to uh, go that route. Um, and also, it looks um, unlike a lot of the vertical mounts. I, I With my last build, I played with one of those. Um, it looks like the way they put it, you can actually put cards behind it because a lot of times with those, when you get those vertical, the third-party vertical mounts, it takes up your entire uh, PCIe section, so you can't use any other cards besides your video card. So, yeah, I mean, now there's a chance that your your card could be so thick that it pushes into those slots, but it looks like they do give you plenty of room for those yeah. two and a half height uh, cards to, to, to kind of slot in there. So, or you could just use water or you could. Yep. Uh, but uh, looking at the, uh, the rest of the design, there's got a mesh uh, magnetic uh, filter on the top there that, uh, you know, you can just peel off for easy, uh, easy cleaning. It's got uh uh, it's got that PSU shroud with cable routing uh, in several places and ventilation where the PSU would go. So if you want to mount your fan pointing up, there's an option to do that. Let's see here. Uh, it's very modular. Uh, things kind of uh, pop off and, and you can clean and, and kind of customize to to what you're looking for. You got three and a quarter, I'm sorry, three and a half inch uh, drive slides there. And... Uh, uh, RGB, uh, there's a fan controller for the uh, RGB fans. See, here, here's where you want to mount your two and a half inch drives. Not behind your CPU, but down here, so they're, they won't melt. Um, and here's a nice, you know, nice finished shot. Sebastian's always got great photography. 
uh, with those RGB fans, just tons of tons of uh, light, tons of effects that are possible. You can run it as a you know like a, a preset, a hardware preset using the the hub, or you can hook it up to your motherboard and coordinate it with other RGB devices uh, if you want to go that way too. You could probably fit a uh, 360 rad up front too. It looks like there's enough room for it because there are three 120 fans up there. Um, uh, I, yes. I wouldn't be surprised also if if uh, either EK or um, Bits Power or someone came out with a uh, a front distribution panel for it as well because that's kind of the you know the latest uh, thing that companies are doing now. I mean, they're expensive, but they look neat if you uh, if they're done right. You don't want to. You want to block any of the RGB fans, though, right? Well, no, you put them up top or something. Oh, okay. So there's, yeah, always, here, there's always ways around that. <laughs> uh, in the uh, in the tech specs, uh, you can do uh, three by one twenty fans up front, or two two by one forty, uh, two by one twenty on the top, one by one forty, uh, and then radiators, yeah, three sixty or two eighty in the front, uh, two forty on top, and a one twenty in the rear. So lots of options there too, if uh, you want to go that route. So you know. RGBs. I, I, I'm probably never going to build a system with RGBs like this. Uh, but man, if you like this kind of stuff, uh, Corsair's got a ton of cases out. And if you're buying those fans, those, are, those addressable RGB fans are expensive. And so something like this, where you're getting $120 worth of fans in a $150 case, uh, probably worth checking out. So gold award from Sebastian for this, the Corsair IQ 465X RGB mid tower smart case. Any, you guys, any, any other thoughts on the cases or anything we've talked about so far? Yeah, I don't really build for RGB. I mean, I build for functionality with whatever comes and is the greatest price. And sometimes my case lights up like a Christmas tree and other times it's kind of dark. But, you know, I don't take the time to install all the software to control that stuff. And my kids don't care. My wife doesn't care. I don't care. So you only want it on know, the back of your monitor. It, it, uh, well, you know that one I do care about because that actually is functional. So, so RGB is nice if you like to do custom color builds. Like I'm always partial to red and black for some reason, <laughs> um, and or white. I mean, it, it's nice that you if to configure them. But uh, the, the one odd thing with uh, the Corsair fans that I've seen, I talked to Sebastian about this when he was doing that review, or maybe it was another one. Uh, was the software you know, when you can you basically can, can only configure the fan uh, the dynamic fan operation in the IQ software, but the it defaults to uh, its normal whatever display mode until you actually boot into Windows and it loads the software. It doesn't actually load your template and save your template, which is kind of odd um, because a lot of that uh, like USB the, controlled. So yeah, my, but they they could backlighting have backlighting does the same thing too. Yeah, but they could they could they could easily put a cap in there or something to preserve the settings during reboot. I mean, that's what I motherboards you set you set an RGB configuration on motherboard and it sticks. You know. So, yeah, but unless you got something very got bad. A BIOS and firmware. And and a writable firmware that can, you know, keep things as long yeah, as but you that, get a little battery in there. That's got a controller on it too though. I'm not trying to be a mean to you, Maury. I'm sorry. Well, I mean, they're all new RARGB addressable light strip with 10 gigs of local storage. Exactly. An independent we power supply. I mean, Cor Corsair does have onboard memory for like configuration profiles for pretty much everything else they make. All their keyboards, mice, headsets. You can all store, you know, one to five different profiles on there. So, yeah, maybe, you know, put it in the hub or something. I don't know. It doesn't have to be in the fan, but put it in the hub and that way it's as soon as the power comes on. But yeah, good to know you. You might have a few seconds of uh, unattractiveness as your, your case boots up before the, the light show starts. And for others like me, it's, it's a, a lifetime. lifetime. There you go. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we talked about this last week, but Josh, so two things. First, I, I only had a spreadsheet to show you because my MacBook died and I couldn't get all the graphs up and it's still dead. And I just had to redo them all in Excel and figure that out. So whatever this might be this this thing may be the one that pushes me away from apple for good i'm going to premiere and i'm going to excel so we'll see but josh wasn't with us i don't believe last week when we talked about ice no lake i ran away whiskey lake yes he ran away to fist bump a monkey as i recall was the insinuation from jeremy 
Well, anyway, uh, so I don't want to spend too much time because we did talk about the basics of it uh, last week, but I did finally get this all, you know, nice and done in a final pretty form. And these are these are Ice Lake versus Whiskey Lake. So to recap very quickly, this is uh, talking about the sort of Ultrabook form factor in that 15 watt ish TDP range. Uh, so you've got low, you know, portability, thin and light, but still somewhat capable systems. Intel's top system last year, up until actually up until this month when they launched Ice Lake, was Whiskey Lake. It's an eighth gen, 14 nanometer part. Uh, AMD's top system was the Picasso based Ryzen 3700 mobile series, 3700U, Zen Plus. And then Intel came out with this Ice Lake, and Ice Lake obviously is their first kind of mass availability or like largely available 10 nanometer process, not only with better CPU, but significantly improved graphics. That was the one thing they hammered on us uh, in the months leading up to this was how good their graphics were going to be generation over generation. And we skipped Gen 10 because Gen 10 was going to be part of Cannon Lake, and we all know what happened to Cannon Lake. So we ignore that, and we say Gen 9 to Gen 11 is one one generation. And technically, I guess that's true because they didn't release Gen 10. But uh, this is uh, the, the charts. This is the kind of stuff they've been sending to us, saying... You know, because Intel Intel integrated graphics have not been at the, the cream of the crop for forever. They've always been behind. They've always been inferior to AMD. And they said in this one generation, we're going to have up to twice the performance over UHD 620 in that Gen 9 Whiskey Lake system. So we said, all right, well, let's test that. And so we went out and we got a Whiskey Lake system with an i5, I'm sorry, i7-8565U. And... uh here are the systems we're looking at. It was an XP HP Spectre X360 up against our Dell XPS 2 and 1, XPS 13 2 and 1 with that Ice Lake i7 1065G7. And then even though this, this is not really focusing on Ryzen, I just wanted to put it in there to just kind of have a, a reference for how the market looked before Ice Lake came. And uh, and so we've got that Ryzen 7 3700U in a ThinkPad. And this is just preliminary. Uh, the the These are very different chassis. Uh, they're, they're running at different thermals. It's hard to like definitively say anything. So we're just, this is like a first look because Ice Lake is so not available yet. Like there's only a couple systems shipping. Once some more get out there, we'll have more to say, but, but kind of as a first look, let's, you know, let's just see how, how did Intel do going from generation to gener generation? And so we've got some CPU benchmarks. We'll skip past those real quick because uh, those are less interesting. We'll go to the, the, to the graphics side of things. So here's 3D Mark Time Spy. Uh, Ice Lake, uh, Whiskey Lake was at 461 overall, and Ice Lake scores at 969. You know, just a, a huge import, uh, perf performance increase. And again, the reason I wanted Ryzen in here is because if you look at the Ryzen bar, which is the orange bar in the bottom here, take away Ice Lake, and that's the market as of August 31st. And you look at how much faster, now the CPU is different, you know, Ryzen kind of lagged Intel and CPUs, even with Whiskey Lake, but in terms of graphics, uh, Ryzen's just crushing Intel, and again, in this 15 watt space, and here comes Ice Lake, and it, it just makes up all the difference, and that's a theme you're gonna see throughout these benchmarks, and uh, I, you can head to PC Pro to look at them all, because again, I don't wanna spend too much uh, time going over everything, but let me jump to the summary. I kind of put everything into a nice like percentage summary here. So here's, uh, some of the apps, and this this is just, forget uh, Ryzen, this is just looking at Whiskey Lake versus Ice Lake. What is the performance, how much better in terms of a percentage is Ice Lake over Whiskey Lake? And you look through uh, Time Spy here, it's over 100%. So that that's that 2X increase that that uh, Intel said they could get up to. And there's a couple here where it breaks that 2X barrier. But at worst case, you're looking at a benchmark like Nova Bench, which is, you know, does, it is of questionable utility. We put it in there because it's free and it's easy to, you know, it's quick and easy to use. And uh, some people argue it's not the best benchmark to use these days, but you know, that's the worst case scenario is a 50% improvement in graphics. And then we look at games and we look both at, at frame rates and frame times. And again, up to 72% better frames per second average, up to 40% better frame times uh, in, in a single generation. So, Pretty impressive from that perspective. There's still questions of uh, availability. There's still questions of price. These are the ice. These ice lake systems are more expensive than their whiskey lake counterparts, and they're more expensive than the the Ryzen stuff. So, uh, 
They can tell us paying attention to the GPU market now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, design for this started about three years ago. So you know that back at that point, they were knuckling down on design teams and said, you know, we we need to compete here because we have so much content that's coming out that is 3D accelerated and AMD is eating our lunch, NVIDIA is eating our lunch in this. And I mean, you know, sure, you know, AMD didn't have the CPUs, but... You know, they always had the graphics. And, you know, they were always people, everybody was hammering on Intel and their integrated graphics and their driver quality. And I knew people internal to Intel who were hammering on the graphics saying, you know, this latest generation CPU, we have like 10 or 13 different graphic technologies that we're attaching to this. I mean, it's just, it was just insane because then you've got to, you know, develop software and drivers for each one of those kind of iterations because they were almost completely, totally, well, not completely, totally different, but significantly different from each other. And so it, it's not like you, you know, had this really portable design that Intel was doing. They, they had multiple design teams. They had project managers inserting, you know, other specifications. It was, it was just chaos. In, in graphics land at Intel. And um, it looks like they've, you know, really have, have righted the ship. And uh, this is a good first step for them to be taken seriously in this area. And, you know, it's, it's good for the industry. It's bad for AMD because that was something that they really hang their, hung their hat on is they had really good integrated graphics and low power graphics and, and all of that in, in these areas. So, yeah, Intel is, they're moving ahead, and, and uh, everybody needs to react really well to be able to keep ahead. And in this case, the the Whiskey Lake is, is kind of whooping up on uh, Vega 10 Ice uh, at the 15-watt. Ice Lake, sorry. Yeah. And uh, I too mean, many, I, I, too many code names. Yeah, there's too many lakes, as we've, as we've sung. But uh, I, I do want to clarify, too, like, yes, uh, Intel caught up. And Intel exceeded AMD in several tests, and they do still have that CPU advantage. But, you know, this wasn't like an apples-to-apples apples comparison. The Ice Lake system, I think, was six over $600 more expensive than the uh, Ryzen system. So if you're looking at those those numbers, and Ryzen does still lead in certain, certain games and certain applications. So, yes, competition for sure. But if you're looking at those numbers and you want to save some money, you can get as good of performance and go with Ryzen and save money there. And it's also worth, again, reiterating, we talk about this every week, that Ryzen 3000 on mobile is not re, is not the same as Ryzen 3000 on desktop. Ryzen on mobile right now is Zen Plus. Ryzen on desktop is Zen 2. So we're waiting. You know, in, uh, AMD is competing right now with its year-old technology versus the latest and greatest from Intel. And so we're waiting for, we don't know when, but hopefully when AMD gets that Zen 2 process into a mobile package, uh, so AMD will take another you know, another step and yeah, we'll be curious what Navi in mobile yeah. Yeah. is going to look like. Yeah. Cause these are very going to be a jump. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we'll probably see another iteration of uh, mobile graphics when the new next gen consoles come out too. Uh, Cause that seems to push the market along pretty well. Well, I mean for a little while. Well, yeah, yeah that's, that's all, that's all Navi. So, and they're working on it and, you know, sure, it's not NVIDIA-based RTX type efficiency, but it's still pretty good, and then they're only game in town. And yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see. Also going to yep. be see interesting to see when, when ARM starts really ramping up their mm. graphics as well. I mean, they already have been, but 5-watt TDP stuff that yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, and I, I do want to uh, also clarify too. What what we looked at was only the top end part that's currently available. This i five, I'm sorry, i seven ten sixty five G seven, and the the level the level of graphics performance we're talking about is limited to those G seven those those part numbers that end in G seven. The G four has uh, lower lower a slightly lower clock and lower execution 
units and then um the g1 even even lower in fact the g1 is not even iris plus they they stick with the uhd label so you know make sure if you're, if you're interested in this aspect of these processors make sure you're looking for that and then also make sure that you're uh that you're looking for just not just 10th gen because as we've talked about intel is kind of confused this situation by adding very, very different architectures under the same umbrella. So 10th Gen Mobile also includes Comet Lake, which is 14 nanometer Skylake based parts again, as down into the 15, uh, the, the, ra the, the range of TDP is different, but they have parts down in this range and they do not have Gen 11 graphics. They do not have the other improvements that would come with the 10th Gen uh, Sunny Cove microarchitecture. So just get, you, gotta, you gotta be careful. You gotta get that decoder ring out and figure out what the part number is to make sure you're getting the right the right part. But uh, but yeah, very 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 impressive on a single generation improvement for Intel and, and graphics there. All right, well at this point we're going to take a quick break to thank our sponsor this week. If you're still using one of the big wireless providers in 2019, have you asked yourself what you're paying for? Between expensive retail stores, inflated prices, and hidden fees, you're being taken advantage of because they know you'll pay. Enter Mint Mobile. Mint Mobile provides the same premium network coverage that you're used to, but at a fraction of the cost because everything is online. Mint Mobile saves on retail locations and overhead and then passes those savings directly to you. Mint Mobile makes it easy to cut your wireless bill down to just 15 bucks a month. And every plan comes with unlimited nationwide talk and text. With Mint Mobile, stop paying for unlimited data you'll never use. Choose between plans with 3, 8, or 12 gigabytes of 4G LTE data. You know, I was with one of the big wireless providers for years, and I probably could have been more diligent about it, but I, I kind of just let it go and paid my bill and went on with my life. But when I found out about Mint Mobile and saw their plans and compared it to what I had been previously paying, I was really surprised and, you know, kind of ticked off. Comparing the two plans based on the data I was actually using, I was paying so much more with that big provider and I couldn't really think of a reason to justify the cost difference. But of course, cost isn't everything. You still need a reliable, fast network. So I checked out Mint Mobile's coverage map, saw that it was available in my area. And then after signing up and testing it out, I was happy to find that the actual coverage was just as good as my old provider. I got some strange looks from my wife, but I spent weeks carrying these two phones around, one with my old previous big provider and one with Mint Mobile. And in every case, the coverage was just as good with Mint Mobile. And on the few occasions where the coverage was poor for every service, uh, an example for me was I had a very long wait in the waiting room of a doctor's office that was located in the basement of a medical building. So that was fun. I still had no problems because Mint Mobile supports features like Wi-Fi calling. And getting set up with Mint Mobile is so easy. Just head to mintmobile.com slash PCPer, pick your plan and sign up. A few days later, you'll receive the welcome kit in the mail, pop the Mint Mobile SIM into your smartphone, follow the simple setup steps, and you'll be up and running in minutes. Use your existing phone, keep your existing number, preserve all your contacts and apps, and continue to have a fast, reliable network. The only difference is you'll be saving so much every month. Ditch your old wireless bill and start saving now with Mint Mobile. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get that plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash PCPer. That's mintmobile.com slash PCPer. Cut your wireless bill to just 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash PCPer. We thank Mint Mobile for their support of the PC Perspective podcast. All right, back to the show. Uh, let's uh, jump into some news. We've had uh, some news this week that's come up. And uh, this next story we're going to talk about, we're, we're not able to speak firsthand on it because Sebastian is the one with our with all the hardware that could have, could have tested and spoken to this, and he's uh, enjoying his well-earned vacation. But uh, over at Tom's Hardware, we have uh, Paul Alcorn, who was able to take a look at this, as we've talked about this, this new Ryzen BIOS update, uh, the ABA, ABBA uh, BIOS update that we that had leaked, that we had talked about, that was that was intended to fix the the frequency issues. And uh, I don't know, did you guys get a chance to, to read his uh, report? Because he did some some testing on this uh, earlier today, or I guess yesterday. There were differences. Uh, they were tiny, as far as performance goes. 
Uh, but I mean, honestly, you, you could see that. Yes, it was just outside the margin of error for testing that it did perform better in almost all circumstances. Because I mean, as much as it's a huge story, and you know, people are quite honestly a little bit miffed that they weren't seeing uh, their cores hit the speeds that they should have been. They were coming damn close. You you weren't seeing your cores, you know, being 500 megahertz below what uh, the, the boost clock was rated at. You were seeing it slightly below. So when they did their benchmarks, you, you did see, you know, a, a tiny percentage gain, you know, 3%, maybe 4%, which is pretty much bang on with uh, what they saw as far as the change in clocks go. Uh, yes, although there was a, a little wrinkle to this that... The clocks were hitting where they should hit, but it wasn't always the core that you wanted. It, it was to being be. used. Yeah. And it was an idle core. It, yep. And so the question is, is this a schedule, a Windows scheduler issue? And we know that Windows scheduler improvements are, are, are constantly on the horizon. They're always coming. Uh, is this further refinement that needs to be done uh, in, the, uh, in, in the BIOS update to, to fix this? Um, cause he said, yeah, he's like all the number, this is kind of like what I was talking about a couple weeks ago. I was like, I don't care if it hits a number. I don't care if it hits 4.6 gigahertz. I want to know how fast it is to render my video or my photos or frame rate no. for my games. And that's kind of what they saw in some benchmarks, not in all, but in some, they said, you know, well, the, the, it was, it was pegging 4.7, 4.65, but the, we, we weren't getting any better performance than what we had previously under the old BIOS that was capping down in the four, 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 three range. So uh, check this out. We'll have a link to this in the, uh, the show notes. Paul went through and did a bunch of tests uh, looking at, at a, a bunch of different factors and speculating as, as to what could be causing it. Uh, so it's, it's a good read. It's an interesting read. Um, and not every vendor has their this BIOS yet. I think he said they tested Gigabyte and was it Asus or MSI? I think they, they, only two of the vendors that they work yeah. with had their BIOSes out. So, so it's rolling out to others. And, uh, you know, I, I guess... The short is it doesn't hurt, you know, if you install it and your core your frequencies goes up, but your performance doesn't go up, it's not going to hurt anything, uh, but it, it would help you get, you know, help them and it would help you get more data into what's happening here. And we'll see if AMD has any more uh, thoughts on this. And hopefully it's just a Windows scheduler issue. Hopefully Pharonix will get their hands on stuff like this and they'll tell, they'll say, oh, it's working fine in Linux. And then, you know, because that's happened before, so. All right, let's uh, move on to the next story then. Uh, we've got some news uh, here that uh, Scott wrote up for us. He's pretty interested in this, uh, Sandboxy, which is the, uh, I guess it's been around since like 2004, 2005. It's a, it's an, an app, uh, that allows you to sandbox, uh, applications and services in, in windows. And, uh, it's going, well, it's, go, it's going open source eventually, but until then they're just going to make the premium paid version of the app free because there was a free version that had limited features. And then there, there was the, the more premium version and uh, the, the developers, uh, Sophos, um, basically said they posted a, a little blog update that said, you know, we're not interested in maintaining this anymore. We don't want to just shut it down. We want to give it to the community. So they're working on, you know, rolling this closed source project into open source, which, uh, as we know, can be challenging. And so in the meantime, they're just going to make it free. So head over to, uh, to the Sandboxy website. We'll have links in the show notes if you want to check that out. Um, you know, this kind of stuff's not just good for security. It's good for, like Scott mentioned in his, uh, his post that it's, it's good for like instancing apps that don't natively support instancing. So you can like lock one copy of notepad into a sandbox and it will always persist with your document there while you're running other documents over here. Uh, so it's a lot of, uh, a lot of neat functionality. It's probably not as useful as it was when it first came out 15 years ago, but, uh, you know, it's free and uh, hopefully it'll be a nice open source project to follow. There's probably nice. another reason behind this too, though. Uh, Windows 10, the latest update for Windows 10, Microsoft is moving towards sandboxing everything. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they're probably pushing them out of the market. Um, I mean, similar to what they've done with every other market virtually. So, uh, yeah. Have you had a chance to play with the uh, sandboxing in the preview builds at all? Uh, the, um, the 19H2 stuff, you mean? Yeah. No, I haven't. I I've, I played a little bit with the 19H1 stuff at work, but um, you know, not too much. 
Yeah, because because it, it, it's I mean certainly Microsoft would be a fierce competitor to have when you have an app like this, you know, similar to Apple running people out of their marketplace. But from what I've seen of the Windows sandboxing currently implemented, it's not great. It's 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 very rigid and it's not very fast and um, you know it'll improve, I'm sure. But yeah, you're right. That, that's uh, there's probably still a reason to hold on to this if you want to. Uh, so so go grab it while you can and see what happens going forward. All right, uh, so our next uh, news story, uh, back to AMD for a bit here. Uh, well, sort of t- sort of back to AMD, not not limited to AMD, but Corsair uh, this week uh, came out with some new Vengeance memory at uh, record-setting speeds. Uh, they've got the Vengeance, uh, I believe it's the LPX. Uh, yes, it's a 16-gig, 2x8 kit that has a uh, uh, rated frequency of 4,866 megahertz at a cast latency of 18. And that's a, as from what I could see in the marketplace and from their press release, they're saying that is the fastest commercially available memory uh, on the market now. And now that's expensive. I think it's like a thousand dollars, nine, nine fifty or something like that. Uh, if you want to go a little slower, you can go to the vengeance RGB pro. So you get some RGBs in there. And uh, that memory is at 4,700 megahertz with a cast latency of 19. So, you know, a little higher in latency, a little slower on the speeds. But uh, but, but uh, that's an option for you. I think that's, um, let's see, 704, $705 for, for the slightly slower memory <laughs> for 16 no, notice that Notice there is a key metric missing, though. They don't tell you what they what they ran the uh, Infinity Fabric, the, the uh, memory... Um, what the uh, memory bus ratio at or memory bus right. speed at because mm. a lot of times the faster you go on the AMD side the slower you have to run that and it if you run it out of sync it can, it can hurt performance a bit and that is that is the kicker um, because yeah you're right the, the, the with Ryzen memory memory compatibility has definitely improved this generation but you still have to worry about your your infinity fabric your your F clock and you want ideally you want to run synchronous uh, to your memory, but there's options yeah, I to think go. What, Ryzen three does a max of thirty seven thirty three. Uh, before thirty six hundred. Uh, what thirty six thirty seven thirty three? Okay, what's there's okay. Yeah, yeah it, it's, if if you're lucky, I mean, I've seen. Yeah. I don't think I've seen. I more just than stick with thirty two hundred because. No, I got I got thirty six synchronous. I think, but oh. yeah, that's that's the highest I've seen. Um, I mean, on the Intel side, you can get four easily. But. Yeah, but uh, at just a different way in, in the way they handle yeah. that. Uh, but if you're if you're interested in that, and you're interested in looking at, uh, you know, how memory, uh, right? I, I guess I should preface this by saying the reason that we brought that up is because Corsair advertised that this was Ryzen ready. They were talking about all these amazing speeds for Ryzen, and then everyone rightly said, "Well, wait a minute, that's probably not going to work out." So, well, you got to be careful with, you know what you're reading that memory at and what kind of processor and board you're using. Uh, and a, a good reference uh, that I saw, I think a week or two ago, Gamers Nexus did a video, and I think they have an article on their website as well, where they just tested like a couple dozen different RAM kits and configurations and speeds and latencies uh, at different uh, ratios with their Ryzen processors. Uh, so it's uh, very, very interesting to kind of see, you know, the, the, the settings that, if, especially if you're coming from Intel, if you've been on Intel for, for a decade, and you're coming to AMD for the first time, you may not understand how different uh, these two platforms handle memory. And so the things you the things you think you're setting in your BIOS that are improving it are maybe slowing it down. So so check that uh, that Gamers Nexus video out. We'll have a link in the show notes to that as well. Uh, the uh, the next story we've got is a uh, another another AMD story. Uh, this one on Epic, and this was a little bit of a, a fun news release that came out uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, there's a company called Beamer, B-E-A-M-R. They're sort of a professional video encoding firm. Uh, so they work with like Hollywood Studios and um, not necessarily Netflix, but but companies like Netflix that need to process and stream video uh, or, or broadcast video. And so they worked with AMD. This wasn't something on their own. This was a concerted effort with AMD to optimize their proprietary video encoding software for these crazy epic processors because you know if if you want to put all these resources towards one task you've got to have super multi-threaded aware applications 
And so apparently they did that. They were able to to tune their software to really take advantage of this Epic 7, 7742 processor. So it's a single server processor. It's got 64 cores, 128 threads. That's their, their top end part right now. And they were able to encode uh, in real time, at greater than real time, it's I think it said 79 frames per second, 8K 10-bit HDR video into HEVC. And that's, all that together is pretty impressive. If you've had any experience with video encoding, not just the resolution, but adding the HDR on top of it, and then, oh, it's going into HEVC, which is far slower than things like um, H.264, and, and doing it in greater than real time on a single processor, and a single processor that doesn't cost that much in the scheme of things compared to what we're used to in those high core counts. This is a $7,000 or so mm -hmm. processor. So, uh, you know, they were very excited. They were talking about, you know, the, the 8K is coming and the Olympics uh, in Tokyo next year are going to be broadcast in 8K. And so making sure that you've got workflows in place uh, for this kind of stuff uh, is important. So, you know, a, a, another one of those... Um, you know, sort of feel good wins for AMD in the server space, showing the advantage of coming to market with so many cores at such a relatively low price point compared to uh, what Intel had in the market. But I don't know, what do you guys think? That YouTube should invest in a few of these? Yeah, right. <laughs> Uploading 4K HDR to YouTube is not real time. Uh, well, sure, yeah. But uh, yeah, hopefully uh, as, as Epic gain some market share we'll we'll get these guys where they need to go these these processors sure but have, have, have you noticed how hard dell is now pushing epic they've had some some serious pay i mean they have like six major models based yep. on the new epic uh servers that are 1s and 2s they don't go beyond 2s but when you look at the core counts of each individual chip you kind of have to question why would you do that because you add more sockets you add a serious amount of extra complexity and especially when you start talking about you know memory access and and we've seen this before with with numa architectures that the more you know core counts you have the more sockets the more problems you have and the more problems the os has and so you know amd is really focused on the one socket two socket and and that's that's it intel does you know more but with their limited budgets and you know the amount of work that they have to do with microsoft to get these things working well uh but yeah i mean you know, i you know obviously maury here is is with dell and he probably can't comment upon it but there has been a lot i mean this started last year when dell started talking when there were a lot of Xeon shortages, like, mm -hmm. have you guys considered Epic? And there was a lot of laughing in the room. It's like, yeah, we're going to go with AMD. And now Dell's like, no, really, you, you need to look at this because we've got core count efficiency. We've got PCIe lanes. We've got an insane amount of IO that can be had in each socket. It's just really, really... A, really a dense architecture with everything that these server guys need and really want and it's a lot more flexible than what we've seen with intel previously so uh we're gonna you know talk more to these folks and see but you know epic is i haven't seen this amount of 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 excitement from you know the the industry guys people who have actually got hands on are building these products are saying you know this is you know the some of the part you know the what the whole is greater than the sum of the parts and and this is true with with the epic the base the seven nanometer stuff and, and um, the bean counters don't mind it either because it is a little bit cheaper, cheaper. not significantly it's, but it's cheaper well, no it's well, in certain it's areas it's significantly okay fair enough cheaper. go go, go price yeah. me a 9200 platinum xeon if you can find someone well, true. who can even authorize you buy that. it from dell you ain't paying well, that price though well, we can't even buy them. That's price. the thing. Like Intel's still holding on to exclusive distribution on those top end Xeons. You got to buy the whole system from them at an undisclosed yep. price. Well, one thing I'm surprised that they didn't hit on in this article is uh, those this uh, processor series would be great for um, VMs and such. VMs, uh, you could run a <laughs> a really kick ass 
uh, VM server off of that chip. I mean, you have to stack, you know, 256 or 512 memory in it or something. But I mean, a, a, a uh, you know, a single server, a single server with a single CPU, you know, for uh, for VM hardware is, uh, you know, that's not easy to come by usually. I mean, and as most of the PR guys I've heard from say, it's a more secure VM from the metal up. Yeah, well, that's the Dell. Dell's pushing VM stuff very hard since they own VMware now. Yeah, that's, oh, that's right. I forgot about that. D-Rack. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're uh, they're they're nice. pushing VMware, the cloud, all this wacky integrated which is, crap. Which is really good for AMD. Because Dell's now pushing AMD servers, and and the VM guys are gonna have to have better support. When 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 you'll see acceleration with this though is when you start seeing Google and Amazon and such switch over their data centers. Because the, I mean they well, have, they have uh, yeah, Baidu did as well. And such. They have who? Yeah, no, I, I think Google was, as well. They were one yeah. of the first groups to offer you know uh, server time on epic based servers with rome mm-hmm. and uh yeah that was that was one of the big things of the amd rome epic uh, release back in 7 7 i think they talked about that Sounds extensively great. same with amazon that they've got servers in production running this stuff and yeah it's just it's so dense so many well, you can request it on those as threads. well what's that you can request it on Azure as well. You can yeah. uh, request an Epic-based uh, instance. This is uh, good changes. for the industry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just a, a quick quick update. We got a new patron, uh, Dan Jan. Hope I'm pronouncing that right. D-A-N-J-A-N. Dan Jan just became a new patron. So thank you very much, Dan. Go Dan. Yeah. Um, uh, but real quick to your point too, Josh, about kind of what happened with the perception of Epic in these last couple of years. I think Intel basically adopting the same strategy kind of underscored, you know, they're going chiplet too. Uh, it's 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 giving you know credibility to something that may have been viewed skeptically initially. Um, but well, this this is the key to expanding Moore's law. Yeah, is process technology is kind of slowing down, but. Packaging and interconnect technology is improving dramatically over these past three or four years. And so, yeah, chiplets, I mean, AMD was a year, maybe a year and a half, two years before Intel, and they've done it really well. I'm hoping, I mean, you know, time will tell, but yeah, it's, it's, it's where, it's where the industry is going because you simply cannot stack all those transistors on to a single cohesive die and expect to be able to make any money. And so, yeah, their their chiplets are. It's going to be the future. I mean, if you look at what Intel has done with, um, you know, I can't remember the name of the previous uh, product with the mobile processor with the AMD Vega graphics that they had that uh, kind of pseudo interposer. In there that worked perfectly fine because you know they didn't need to fab this massive interposer for everything they they just kind of use an edge and uh really route the uh the pads and whatnot uh intelligently and get that kind of speed and so yeah i mean packaging is is now the next stage in in keeping moore's law going as things get really tough at the you know microscopic scale. Okay, uh, let's uh, let's uh, finish up the news. We've got another story uh, real quick here. Uh, Logitech this week uh, came out with something uh, that will make the fans of the G six O two, which is a you know popular, well established Logitech gaming mouse, uh, happy. They came out with the G six O four. It's a wireless gaming mouse. It's a hundred dollars. Configurable controls. Uh, including six buttons along the thumb. Like, now I, I personally would hate that because I rest my thumb there. But if you're a like a mobile gamer or battle royale, and that's you know where you want your quick action action buttons, you've got uh, all those controls right there. Uh, you've got a uh, the, the the rest of the customizable buttons uh, throughout the the device, and then also it communicates via light speed, which is their their proprietary low latency wireless technology. 
but also Bluetooth. And you, there's a little button right on top, right beneath the uh, uh, scroll wheel, which allows you to switch on the fly. So you can either switch to the same computer to save battery life, or you can connect it to two different computers and switch between them just by pushing a button there. It's not rechargeable. It runs on a AA battery, which can be helpful because you can just pack a couple extras and you know be ready to go once it dies. And they say it'll get up to 240 hours on light speed or up to five and a half months on Bluetooth on that single AA. Do they mention anything about it syncing with your keyboards and stuff or no? Because that'd be kind of cool if you could sync it with a key... Um Logitech keyboard and actually switch the whole system over. I don't think so. I don't think any of their products really do that. Um, yeah, it would, it's a direct connection to the computer. No, that was so, last week. What was that mouse? That well, no, I mean, well, the, 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 uh, the dongle, like the dongle is, is what uh, the mouse connects to, right? So, I mean, a wireless keyboard would uh, theoretically could connect the same dongle. It's kind of. Oh yeah, the, the, uh, yeah, Logitech peripherals can share light speed dongles, yes. um, but I don't think it'll let you switch switch both via that. Yeah, yeah it's it's. Uh, but, Still got to uh, use a KVM. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's uh that's the uh, the Logitech G six oh four. It's an update to the uh, venerable G six oh two, which first came out in twenty thirteen. So uh, it's available now, hundred bucks. Or sorry, it'll be available later this month for hundred bucks. So. Check it out if you're looking for a uh, flexible, long-life, wireless gaming mouse. Back to AMD with our next story. Uh, this is exciting. Uh, so there's been some rumors that, uh, I believe, was it the Inquirer found, that suggests that Microsoft's upcoming Surface-based laptops and devices may be powered by Ryzen processors. Uh, they've been exclusively powered by uh, on, on the on the pro side by Intel, and then of course the the short lived uh, RT, which was ARM, but uh, never AMD. Microsoft's never had a, a computer, I believe, with an AMD processor in it, or AMD, you know, as as the primary processor. Uh, ARM, obviously. yes, yes, they've AMD. gone ARM, but not AMD. So, um, I like the Surface devices. Uh, my wife has a Surface Book. Uh, it's actually getting to the point where it's. Wearing out. And here uh, I thought I liked uh, you, Jim. Oh, they're all right. The Surface Book's all right. She likes to draw. She's an artist and an architect. She draws on it. It's yeah, helpful okay. to have the screen come off. Um, she was lucky. And oh, you do try and, you know, work with Microsoft products on them. They're pretty good. <laughs> sure. Well, that's true. She's in Revit all day. So she's just yeah. uh, dealing with Autodesk's bullshit. But uh, yeah, I mean, that'd be interesting to see AMD as a choice there, uh, especially. Uh, de depending on the timing of this, like if this if this is Zen 2 mobile, then yeah, sure. Uh, if it's Zen Plus again, you know, okay, it's at least an option, but. Maybe it'll make the price a little bit more digestible. I would Because so. the service laptops are expensive. They are. I just, I don't think, looking at like what they've done with like the Surface Studio and the pricing there, I mean, they're, they're setting prices based on a market position. I don't think it. If they save some they're money, they're competing with Chromebooks. Come on, didn't you know this? No, they're not. <laughs> That's the thing. They, their partners are. They've decided to enjoy this little niche of a market that they think they've carved out for themselves, and yeah. uh, they are. They Wait, are very is, expensive. Isn't a Chromebook just a overpriced tablet, Jeremy? Really? Need I say no any more? No response. I, there doesn't need to be one. <laughs> But uh, uh, Josh doesn't agree. He's getting mad now. He's got apparently yet stuck in Google or something. I ain't mad. I'm just saying that, you know, $230 laptops are still pretty functional and they give you a decent amount of features. Not a lot of memory and storage, but, you know, the Chromebooks don't need a lot of memory. Huh. No, well, your storage is all. Unless, of course, you so. get 57 tabs open, then you're effed. <laughs> Well, the Surface will gladly move all of your stuff up to your personal OneDrive folder. Oh, Even yeah. if you're in a business and don't actually have a personal OneDrive folder, you've got OneDrive for business, it will still move it up to that non-existent cloud storage and delete it from your local machine. Josh, you need to reboot your machine more than once a month, okay? Daily, man. Cleanliness is next not, to godliness. Not with the 57 tabs Wait, open. Say that again. Not Cleanliness <laughs> is next to God. Hey, have you seen my floor? He's not saying he's a god. Come on. 
Look, it's it's. Oh yeah, all right. There's a cat, and there's there's the uh, cleanup. You know, and it got rid of a lot of the papers and a lot of the garbage. And I'm getting there. Nice. I'm getting closer right. to godliness. But, uh, all right. Uh, last story for the day. Uh, another topic. Uh, I guess it's been AMD news most of the week here. Uh, although this one might not be uh, uh, so positive. It's, it's a rumor, but. There is some concern uh, report out of DigiTimes saying that uh, with all of this demand for seven nanometers, you know, from AMD, obviously their their product portfolio is seven nanometers now, and and or the bulk, you know, the, the, the marquee products are, and Apple and and other mobile devices that that TSMC may be running out of capacity, uh, and and that the this this source, this anonymous source that spoke with DigiTimes, said that uh, they're they're scrambling, uh, that T- TSMC is scrambling, they're they're partners like AMD are scrambling to find alternatives and like the lead time is up to six months. So again, rumors, DigiTimes does not have a perfect track record. They've been right before, but, but not perfect. Uh, but it, you know, it makes sense that, uh, especially with Apple and there's limited, limited, uh, uh, places you can go to take care of these, uh, fabrication needs at that, at that, uh, size. So yeah, this, this is not, uh, this is not exactly unexpected if, if this is true. Nope. And I think, it probably is because there is a need for greater density, higher performance transistors in a large portion of the marketplace. I mean, it's it's not like you've got this random chipset that, yeah, I can do 45 nanometer for it and it's going to be perfectly fine and it's going to be expensive and I'm going to be able to make a profit off of this is AMD competing with Intel. This is Apple competing with the rest of the mobile market. This is everybody else who wants to have a seven nanometer part that TSMC has shown to be stable, fast, and good yields pretty much right off the bat and have excellent density as compared to pretty much everything else except Intel 10 nanometer off the bat. And I mean, they're all the only game in town for these chips. And AMD got in early with them to be able to get, you know, like the 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 Vega 10, 7 nanometer stuff. They're going full bore with the Ryzen 3000 series with, you know, Zen 2. And now they're, you know, they've got Navi and Apple is trying to get stuff and everybody else and their dog is trying to get TSMC seven nanometer space, especially in, you know, phones. We've got next generation ARM stuff coming out here pretty soon. Uh, Samsung has not gotten up to speed on their close to seven nanometer global foundries. They've abandoned all of their development uh, at this time with anything less than their 12 nanometer process. And then Intel is not, they're, they're not, they're not going to license out their their latest and greatest to anybody else. And plus, they've got their hands full with their own issues. And so, yeah, TSMC is the only it's the only guy who's doing this stuff. And there is a huge market for ultra dense, power efficient, fast semiconductor products that really right now only they can provide. And it's uh. Yeah, it's it's. I am curious how that is going to affect AMD. Uh, what are the things that they have put in place to try to mitigate some of their wafer space being taken away? Though that probably wouldn't work very well. But yeah, it depends on the contract involved <laughs> and uh, how well they they negotiated. It's crazy, and they think this is probably one of the reasons for the low. Um, availability of the 3900 and what was supposed to be released by now the 3950x i guess was it end of, end of september or what was the the deadline yeah for that? They, they they ain't getting there brother they they may have a couple of samples out by the end but you can not pick up the 3900x for you know you go on new egg it's a thousand bucks and you can get one yeah uh, you can go on to other areas and they say three to five days and we'll maybe ship this for, you know, $550 for the 3900X. And who the hell knows if you'll actually get one because those things are in high demand because that is a 
dense, dense amount of computing in a low power core. Yeah. TSMC is really happy right now because they can pretty much charge whatever they feel like. And fortunately, AMD doesn't really have the, the money to be able to throw at them to say, uh, yeah, don't bump us for Apple. Whereas Apple is just, you know, it, it's raining money on TSMC until TSMC says, yeah, all right, we'll bump you up. Back to life. O- only Apple could ruin the PC enthusiast hardware market by choking out Again. AMD supply. Yes. All right. Well, that's that's the news items. Uh, I do want to uh, mention we have another uh, Patreon here. Uh, it is uh, it's Igor Shrouded Wolf. Igor uh, has raised his pledge, so thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Glad you could join us tonight. I see you in the chat there. Happy to have you here. All right. So, uh, Jeremy, uh, I think you're up first. Tell us what you found for us here. Um, not much. It was a slow week, but hey, free game, literally. Uh. Thanks to a release of the X-Ray engine, modders have been going nuts uh, on originally the original Stalker. Uh, they've been sticking with Call of Pripyat lately because it's the newest one. So the deal with this is that it is a total redo, which combines all three of the maps uh, from all three games, as well as adding some interesting new features to it. Uh, it's totally free to download on mod db because that essentially there there is a, a an agreement from uh, the company that says it's, it's a little vague but more or less reads yeah do whatever the hell you with it what you want with it just don't charge money for it and so the x-ray engine might feel a little bit dated in some things but overall was always impressive uh they did lighting beautifully uh and the, the weather effects are you know one of the most famous things for it this now has brand new story, uh, as well as a bunch of different missions and such. And apparently, uh, one of the draws for the younger kids is it, it's got sort of a discord thing going where you can turn on a radio and listen to what's going on with the NPCs as they're running around doing stuff. And we'll also talk about what you've done. Uh, so you've got sort of some chatter going on just to make it a little more entertaining. I haven't picked it up yet because the one thing about Stalker is it's it's hard. It, it's not an easy shooter, and you will find yourselves in corners often where you're, you're kind of screwed. But it's fun, it's atmospheric, and free. So check out Stalker Anomaly. Who needs real-time ray tracing? Look at this. Yeah. Incredible. But, I mean, the textures will look a little bit dated for some people. Nice. I've never played those games. They look... Uh... I tried to once, and it just didn't work out very well. I've played the first one straight through uh, and enjoyed it, and then the next ones just didn't get into them because it was a big investment. I They do realism in that you got to eat or you'd freaking die. Mm-hmm. Uh, your, your gun, the, this wonderful new gun that you've got, uh, starts to degrade as you use it. And you can't just say, oh, well, I'll find someone else with that gun and put them together and it's up to 100% health again. It was a little more involved than that. Wow. Yeah, I can't. I can't think that much when I'm playing video games. Kind of like System Shock 2. Yeah. yeah. Your guns just degrade. You got to repair them and you got to spend points and things. It's just, yeah. 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 I'm I'm enjoying Prey, but I'm struggling getting through it for that sort of thing where it's you've you got to think you, you can't just sort of run around and have fun yeah and I, I understand the appeal of it and everything but like i tried to play um kingdom kingdom come Deli- kingdom come deliverance a couple of years ago when that came out i don't know if you guys yeah. have any experience with that but that's one of those like you have to feed yourself you have to heal yourself i kept dying of starvation i wasn't taking baths so nobody no, the npcs wouldn't talk to me because i stunk <laughs> like legitimately like, that was part of the like you couldn't get places if you hadn't bathed in a certain period of time. So, man, does rain I, count? Uh, it does actually. I think, as I recall, but not if you still had to go to a bathhouse if you wanted to like go visit a noble. Yeah, uh, it's crazy game, crazy game. Yeah, that's too involved for me. Doom and Wolfenstein are more my speed. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Ten years um, ago when it came out, yeah, but not anymore. Uh, Josh, I think you've got the next pick for me. us. Yeah, for uh, what? 
257 bucks essentially. It is a Samsung curved 27 inch 1440p and 144 hertz monitor with a VA panel, not TN, but an actual VA panel. So it looks pretty good versus TN. Maybe not as good as an IPS, but it's still really, really good. This is this is an extremely inexpensive, looking good, high quality monitor. It uh, may not have tilt or any of those other fun things that other monitors may do. I mean, they've cut corners where they can. But the final product, when uh, you're watching it, looks pretty good. Now, the only interesting thing that it doesn't have it doesn't support FreeSync, which is which is kind of odd. So you're going to have Wait, to deal with that. But it's what? What do you use 144 hertz for then? Yeah, because I mean that's because you know, everything else is going to run at 60, right? Well, well no, you, it you depends. Can... You can play CSGO I mean, you can on, your, it. on your Titan at 144 yeah, I watts. Mean, you know, you, you could, your, your video card may run at 90 hertz or 90 frames per second. And so you're going to get no frame pacing with even the 144 hertz refresh rate. And so you'll get you know multiple frames if you've got V-Sync on uh, versus some tearing with V-Sync off. And then FreeSync solve those problems essentially so yeah you're not getting the free sync functionality but if you're looking for a pretty good quality gaming monitor with good colors good speed all of that stuff slight curve to it uh, 1440p you know at a 27 inch that's that is dirt cheap for what you get it's a pretty good price. And I think I think the ad server at Rock Paper Shotgun has been compromised. I left the tab open and it's now trying to download executable files. You should, you should not. <laughs> oh, nice. I, I try to leave the ad block off because, you know, publisher to publisher, support each other. But come on, guys. You get all these like <laughs> popovers and crazy ads. What do you got for us? All right. So for my pick, uh, it looks like Fantax came out with a new version of an RGB digital strip. Uh, this is actually a, um, a solid strip. It's kind of like that. Uh, I think it's called it was uh, EM EM tape or something. Uh, but this is uh, you know this is a solid plastic strip that's bendable, and you know you, so you can configure it any way you want really. Um, and you, it's not separate LEDs. It's actually the entire strip is is an LED somehow, um, or it has embedded LEDs or something. Uh, but it, you know, it really gives a, a kind of a, a, a better solid, um, a better, uh, glow experience, you know, uh, more configurable glowing experience than you would get, uh, with the light strips that are made up of individual LEDs. It's just neat. I don't know what the pricing on it's going to be. I mean, my guess based on pricing of other things is probably it'll fall in a, 40 to 60 range i mean they may price it higher than that but that would be my guess um the kit comes with two strips and a uh, command module and it looks like it's compatible with all of the uh, major rgb integrations gigabyte asus corsair so um yeah so you know just uh, kind of a cool little thing I, i'm not sure how bright it is i mean that's the one thing with uh with these uh with these strips that's always kind of questionable because i mean that like um the uh rgb uh, light strips are very bright depending on what you get like the corsair ones tend to be really good and some other manufacturers tend to be really good um it's always been kind of a problem with the el tape and that kind of thing is the brightness of them um but you know if you're going for you know if, if they aren't as bright you know sometimes you want that more muted lighting design so but it's you know it's, it's an inter- interesting concept, and uh, we'll have to see how it plays out. Very cool. Yeah, that's, that's I mean I, I've seen light strips before. I've never seen something sort of so refined like this. Um, but neat. All right. And uh, I forgot to pick because I was just struggling to get that whiskey like article finished before uh, the show. But I guess my my pick will be uh, with Sebastian out this week. Uh, he normally hosts this week in computer hardware with Patrick Norton on Thursdays at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. And so I'm going to fill in for him 
And so uh, if you don't normally watch, uh, tune in because uh, I have the stink of failure on me. And so it'll probably be the last show. I'll probably, I'll probably call it quits after uh, I've graced uh, the Twit Network with my presence. So uh, if you don't, if you want to check that out tomorrow, 12, I'm sorry, tw it's uh, 1230 Pacific, 330 Eastern. That's Thursday. And, uh, and then if, if you're listening to this on demand, uh, you know, download it, see how it went. Patrick's a good guy. Uh, haven't uh, I've emailed him? I've never actually spoken to him before, and so and this, will, like I said, this will be our first time on the Twit Network. So we'll see how that goes. Well, that's it for the show this week, folks. Uh, so glad you could join us again. We do these Wednesday nights at 10 p.m. Eastern live at pcpro.com/slash live, and uh, be sure to head over to pcpro.com/slash subscribe so you know when we go live. And uh, I guess, uh, of course, uh, always follow all the articles. We'll have uh, show notes at the site. That's pcpro.com. Uh, we post the videos at YouTube, and then we have podcasts, uh, video and audio podcasts that you can uh, get the feeds for your preferred podcatcher. Uh, well, we hope you all have a great week. Until we see you next time, take care.